Welcome to the Culture and Sports Podcast, where we have discussions about how leadership and organizational culture impact organizational success, team and athlete performance, and the short and long-term mental, physical, and emotional health of athletes. The Culture and Sports Podcast is brought to you by Culture and Sports. Culture and Sports helps sports organizations, teams, coaches, support and front office staff, and athletes understand the importance of leadership and organizational culture and its direct impact to success. I'm Dr. Jeremy Piasecki, and this is the Culture and Sports Podcast. Welcome back to the Culture and Sports Podcast, where we discuss the impact of leadership and organizational culture on organizational success, team and athlete performance, and the short and long-term mental, physical, and emotional health of athletes. I'd like to introduce you to to today's guests, We have Robert Bolin and Michael Chapman. Bob is an assistant professor of sports law at Seton Hall Law School and the former athletics integrity officer at Penn State University from 2017 to 2022. Michael is a former member of the U.S. Center for Safe Sport Compliance Team. Both Bob and Michael are of counsel for Shoemaker, Loop, and Kendrick. Shoemaker is one of our leading sponsors for Culture and Sports' first annual leadership summit and will be leading one of its sessions, applying a new legal standard to crisis prevention and response in sports. It's a sincere pleasure to have both of you on today. Thank you, Jeremy. Please, it's a pleasure to be yeah, with you. Jeremy. Yeah. Uh, Bob, we'll start with you. Please tell us a little bit about your sports journey. Well, uh, we'll we'll get to the part, we'll we'll fast forward to the part that's of interest to people today. I played football and I wrestled at Columbia University, uh, Ivy League, uh, a good experience, although not that many wins in football and plenty of wins in wrestling. Uh, Enjoyed the experience so much that I wanted to build a career in sports. I worked as an agent and a player representative after going to law school um, and working in college sports a bit before that. And then I... uh, I became a professor at first at NYU and then at Ohio University of sports management and sports business. I, I always laugh that I had just a few number of clients to be credible or just enough clients to be credible and, and not so many that it was a big drag on my on my income to uh, come <laughs> teach. But teaching really was the greatest passion I've had. And it's where I met Michael. Uh, it's where so many good things have happened in my life. So I've always kind of had a foot in academia and a foot in the real world. And I think that's where professors should be. Uh, In 2017, kind of relevant to this topic, I took one of the most unusual jobs in the world uh, as athletics integrity officer at Penn State. Penn State was coming off the Sandusky scandal. They were about four years out from it at that point. They were still under a consent decree with the NCAA and the Big Ten. And I helped Penn State kind of leave that decree behind, move on to an independent monitorship program and, and really do it in a collegial way. So I'm proud of my time there. Uh, there were a lots of bumps and bruises and a lot of friction because athletics <laughs> is a very emotional space and people take very emotional positions in it. But, uh, you know, it's an important space. It, it was an important part of the identity of the university. It's an important part of the identity of who we are as athletes or as people. And, and fairness and goodness and decency has a place there. So that's one of my things I'm drawn to culture and sports and and to this program and to working at the summit with you. And Michael, um, why don't you tell us a little bit about your sports journey as well? Yeah, so uh, I, I did not play sports at an Ivy League school in college, uh, but uh, from from a young age, I always kind of knew I wanted to stay at least connected to sports in some way, shape or form. Could have been any number of, of, of reasons and, and ways to do so. Um, uh, I was an accountant by trade initially, so I worked at Deloitte for a couple of years. And when I, you know, as I was there, I realized, no, I really wanted to move back towards the sports world. In order to do that, uh, I had a, a, a mentor of mine when I was an undergrad who was a professor at Ohio University for the, the master's of sports program there. So um, he connected me with Bob and um, I went to law school at Ohio State. Um, before I'd even met Bob, I decided to go to law school because that was always something in the background for me. I went to Ohio State's law school. Then I went to uh, the master's program at Ohio University. That's where I met Bob. I was fortunate enough to kind of connect with him um, and and send my my path in in that direction. And essentially, what happened is I used my auditing background from my time at Deloitte, and I was able to apply it in a legal setting, essentially, and in a sports world by joining the U.S. Center for Safe Sport. And so I joined them back in 2019 
after I'd finished graduate school. I was one of the first three members of the compliance team there. So the center was just getting started. Um, less than a year before I started, I believe, was when um, Congress had passed a law that had, had given the United States Center for Safe Support authority over national governing bodies in the USOPC when it came to investigating claims of sexual abuse and things of that nature. And so I started to do that work. My work was more focused on the policies we were putting in place for NGBs to do and how could we enforce those? How could we audit NGBs against them and do all of those things? Um, I was there for almost three years, left there uh, a little less than two years ago now. And after I was gone for a little while, I realized I really still wanted to work in that area. I still wanted to help sports. Uh, I realized I developed something of a passion, but I also thought instead of trying to be on the side, helping enforce the rules, why don't I help NGBs, help governing bodies, help you know organizations like that be the one making the change rather than kind of reacting to what somebody's telling you to do how do we do this you know kind of from a proactive perspective so um i joined bob as of counsel at shoemaker and and we work to help ngbs with investigations or say sport compliance or just general general athlete safety matters and and that's where i am now and it's it's the passion i've developed and, and why i continue to do this work and continue to want to do this work moving forward so, Michael, you were just talking about uh, U.S. Center for Safe Sport, and you joined still in its infancy. Uh, can you please share how Safe Sport grew over time and what your role was in that growth? Yes. Yeah, so when I joined, I can't remember exactly how many we had. I want to say roughly 30 employees. That sounds about right. Maybe we were a little over, a little under when I had joined. It was right around that time where we were getting around 30 employees. I can't tell you the number they had. By the time I left, I think they were approaching uh, 100 or hundred more employees. And essentially what they've gone through as a growth cycle is they were started even before they were given the full authority by the law that Congress passed as a way to investigate claims of sexual abuse, of child abuse, of things like that. Uh, the Larry Nassar case is the most obvious case that kind of started them down that path. But I think it was coming regardless. That was maybe the impetus to really push it in a way that it hadn't been pushed before. Mm -hmm. And at, at the end of the day, um, the growth cycle they've gone through is how do we go from a small organization that doesn't have official authority and, and all of these things to growing to the organization they are now, which has a, a bunch of departments. It, it handles uh, any number of investigations. It doesn't just handle necessarily sexual abuse and child abuse. Those are their, though those are their primary focus. And I want to say I heard a number at one point with people I know there, they get roughly 8,000 complaints a year. It might be more than that now. So you're talking about an organization that went from a few hundred complaints their first year to thousands and thousands of complaints that they at least are given. And then either they or the NGB has to, to answer to and, and kind of investigate and, and resolve. So um, I, I think their growth cycle has been in crazy. Um, when I was there, it was, it, it felt like we were doubling our, our staff size every six months or so. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I can't imagine um, how things would have been had we not done that. So yeah, their life cycle is, it's still in its infancy too. I, I don't think they're anywhere near to a semi, even a semi mature organization. They're still in their infancy trying to figure it out. And I think the people over there are very passionate about this work and are very committed to doing all of the right things. And they're definitely doing their best to head in the right direction of how do we help solve this issue within sports. So obviously this is a huge societal issue that we're having. Um, and all those complaints, uh, you know, the number you gave was about 8,000. Um, so how does safe sport with its still semi small staff investigate 8,000 complaints a year? And with that, and assuming that that growth continues, uh, because obviously not everyone is reporting, but as we progress through the next few years and decades, it's probably going to be 10, 15,000 every year. How does a small organization like the U.S. Center for Safe Sport actually investigate all of those complaints? Well, so they, they kind of look at it a few ways. One of the things they do is they will do their initial review of the complaint an initial gathering of facts that they'll do before they ever send it to an investigation. So it's kind of like uh, 
it, it, it's not as urgent, but there's like a level of triage like you would have at a hospital in a, in a emergency situation where you're trying to figure out what are the most crucial area ones that they have to get to, which ones do they need to get to earliest and which ones maybe that can they take their time, which ones have enough information to proceed. The other thing they're doing is they're going through their jurisdictional questions of if it's sexual abuse or child abuse, they are the sole group that has the authority to investigate those claims. Those would never be returned to a national governing body for review. But say, for example, it's a hazing question. There's a, a hazing complaint that's been filed with them. That then might get returned to a national governing body. That's the kind of thing that in our practice with Bob and I that we might help an NGB investigate is here's what's going on. So the 8,000 case, the complaints, that's 8,000 complaints. The number of cases they're then investigating is small because you have cases where they don't have jurisdiction, cases where their jurisdiction isn't the exclusive jurisdiction for them, and they can return it to an NGB, so they might do so, let the NGB handle it and do the investigation, or it might just be, you know, uh, there's not enough information. Unfortunately, one of the things that we still deal with this in, in this space is uh, somebody might file a complaint but you still have to have actionable information. And so if somebody's not willing to participate or if you can't put the information together in a way that gives you enough facts to then proceed with an investigation, sometimes things in there. So there are any number of reasons where as they're going through that process, and I wasn't directly involved with it, but I at least saw kind of how it operated. They're kind of doing it step by step. Okay, we get the complaint. What's it about? What's the nature of the complaint? Is it the kind of complaint we would take if they're the center? Is it the kind of complaint the center would take if it is, start their fact gathering, um, do their intake process, make sure that they've got enough information and enough people willing to participate in the process to kind of proceed from there. And then it would go to an investigation and then that investigation would proceed and they'd go all the way through. So you've got 8,000 cases, but you're splitting up your staff. It's not all investigators, all claims being investigated. There's kind of a few steps before you would get to that official formal investigation, which is a great way to do it because that then allows you to do that triage, for lack of a better word, of let's separate out what cases we're going to, that the center is going to take versus which ones the center's not. And then the ones that we're not going to, the center's not going to take, they could send to NGBs or, or whoever needs to, to handle the investigation. So, Bob, you were the former athletics integrity officer at Penn State University. Can you please explain what that exactly means and how it supported the students, the teams, and the organization, like the, the university as a whole? Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And, and actually, Michael's express, ex, ex, explanation of safe sport is not too terribly different than that role. I was there to receive complaints coming from athletics. Uh, related to the conduct of the people involved in intercollegiate athletics, whether it was the athletes, the administration, the coaches. Uh, I was there to prevent misconduct and work on policies in athletics to comply with federal and state laws, including Title IX and, uh, and the Cleary Act, among others. And I had an investigative responsibility to look into some of those. And much like Michael, I received a lot of complaints and we had to triage them and make sure that there was an actionable item and, and then investigate them. In, in my five years, I was sort of thinking through this. Um, I, I probably worked on what I would call 50 significant investigations. And by significant, they got written, put in a written decision uh, somehow or a written report. Uh, if I dealt with it with an email or I closed it because there was no complainant or no ability to investigate, it had come in through the hotline. Some of those were, were just obviously easier. So I always had a few cases going. Um, I think the vast majority of them were, were pretty easy uh, and some were obviously more difficult and some also implicated other branches that the university had to investigate as well. So if it came involving discrimination, uh, gender violence, uh, some sort of retaliation, all those were, were also investigated by other bodies at the institution. So I assisted in those investigations too. So we did a lot of joint investigations. So that was another piece of it. But, you know, if you think about it, it's not a lot of people at the institution. It was about 800 athletes and about 300 staff around it, but it's a $181 million annual business. Uh, it is a, a big piece of what makes a college distinguished from its peers with what conference it belongs to, how it competes. So it was a big piece of the identity of, of, of athletes. 
And it's a place where not not Penn State in particular, because I'm not a, not in, not inferring this, but athletics as a whole, it's a place where a lot of very rational people lose their objectivity uh, for one reason or another. And so the goal was to make sure that we really maintained objectivity over over key issues. Uh, I think I left leaving half the people angry with me and half the other half of the people angry with me for the opposite reason. So I feel like I did a good job, but no one really kind of comes away with a clean sheet from these things. And after five years, I think there's a lifespan in those jobs. So I, I moved on from that. But if you think about cases that are going on right now and in the news, um, hazing being the accusation at a couple of schools, you really want to have a lot of information and you want to have some ability to respond institutionally. And you may be asked to look back into your past institutionally and say, hey, what did we do and when did we know and when did we learn about it and how did we, how did we respond to that? And that's a big piece of what that job was. And I, I think, and I don't want to go on too long, Jeremy, I'll let you get to your next question, but the Sandusky crisis for Penn State cost the institution multiple years uh, of, of, of reputation. A number of people came and went without certain things being resolved. Uh, and, and, and I mean that, but time passed in that job, but Penn State really came together very well and opened itself up in the free report and, and tried to set processes in place that they minimized the harm still with not even killing human toll about a $350 million crisis, uh, from 10 years ago. If you think about Baylor and their title IX situation, somewhere North of 500 million, Michigan State with Nasser around a billion when we get done with it, probably. And then some doctor cases at Ohio State and Michigan in the $500 million range. And it's a really significant thing. And also as a, uh, and, and again, I hate to, hate to kind of keep going back to another thing, but as a public not-for-profit, the way you treat people is the only thing you really can, can judge yourself on. You know, if, you, if a large company, you know, starts a fire or has an oil spill, they can do remediation in other places. Uh, they mm -hmm. can clean up other coastlines. They can do other things. You know, you really can't in a not-for-profit university, which are large businesses now, you really can't just plant some trees and make it be better. You have to actually help the people. So I was very proud to have that job. And I'm very proud of the work that Michael and I do at Shoemaker trying to, to both make change and to make the human toll a little bit lighter in the in the process for the, the the organizations involved. So let me ask you both a question. If I was an athlete uh, at any level and I filed a complaint, uh, but I didn't give enough information, whether it's the U.S. Center of Safe, Safe Sport, whether it was you as the athletics integrity officer, or even with both of you conducting investigations uh, in your roles at Shoemaker. Um, but I didn't give you enough information as the athlete because I was afraid of retaliation. Do you pick up on things like that? Like, how do you get the information from that athlete who's deathly afraid of being retaliated against because of the extremely toxic culture they're in and they just think it's going to become worse. And then in their mind, it's almost like it would actually be better if I said nothing because I just don't want to be yelled or screamed at or assaulted again. Like, how do you, how do you work through that? How do you work with the athletes to make sure they feel safe and that, that it's a confident process? You want to go first, Michael? Sure. I, I think one of the big things is you have to have some intentionality on the front end for taking reports of giving people some comfort and some knowledge that there are actions that can be taken. So the, the center, the center will tell you this when they get a case and every NGB I know is the same way that retaliation itself is a violation of policy. And so I think there is some upfront you can do to maybe help somebody feel comfortable the other thing I think that you kind of have to do is you have to help that person understand that uh, if they're coming forward with a complaint and it's something that has been there and something that needs to be addressed, and maybe it's lingered for five, 10 years, maybe it's something that's been kind of underneath that nobody's ever reported. Are you setting up future generations to deal with the same thing? And is that mm -hmm. something that you really want to deal with? Because I think that's one of the impetuses for a lot of, you know, an impetus for somebody to come forward is, I want my situation to be better, but I also don't want anybody else to deal with what I'm dealing with. And so 
if you can provide them some comfort in the front end of we have retaliation policies, if they do that, that in and of itself is a violation, we can protect you, we can help you, we can take action just on that if we have to. I think that eases their mind. But then, uh, you know, to a degree, kind of getting to why they're reporting. And I think for a lot of them, it is not just for them, but for everybody else. They don't want anybody else to deal with what they're dealing with either. And if that's the case, you can kind of use that to your advantage of saying, well, you need to help me take action. You need to help me gather all the information so I can do something. Because if, you, if you're not willing to help me, then we're just going to let this linger. It'll linger for another five years until somebody comes forward. So I think you can do both of those, but I'm sure Bob's got other things that you can do and other actions you can take to kind of encourage participation in that standpoint. Yeah, I think, I think the, the, the most courageous act is the person who stands up both for themselves, but also for those around them. Uh, and, and even though there is maybe the possibility, there is some flack in, in return for that. I, I think you always have to really respect that. And that's why non-retaliation policies are really the first principle of all compliance programs and all, all, get, all chances for us to get to our best ethics. But let's, let's talk about some nuts and bolts that even are effective out there. And I think everybody needs to think about right now you probably need to have an anonymous reporting hotline system that allows you to reach back out through the, that, that system to the complainant. So uh, whether that, that's the, uh, the equivalent of you know, a knot hole in a tree where you leave notes for each other in, uh, in an electronic format or whether it allows you to get more information, I think you certainly have to have that ability. I, I think that's a mandatory one. And even though a lot of people don't like hotlines because they produce they produce non-responsive and non and non non-investigable complaints a fair amount. They also help you become aware of things maybe earlier than you would before they become a really bad problem, and that's really important. I think just knowing about situations will give you some ability to help cure them. Uh, that was certainly in a true in the, in, a, in an institutional setting. So if you're aware or hearing allegations of hazing or some other misconduct, you can always stress what that means to the, to the participants um, and, and, and explain that to the coaches and others that this isn't something that's going to be allowed. I, I think most coaches want to do the right thing. Most administrators get into this field because they want to do the right thing. They passionately love the sports that, that they do. And sometimes they don't understand the seriousness of what's going on or, or how things have changed since they were athletes. So this mm -hmm. is a chance also for education too. Uh, you know, maybe the maybe the first compliance program after after having an anonymous reporting system and a non retaliation policy, kind of one A one B and one C, is having an educational program. The best compliance program mm -hmm. is an educational one. So I do think that that's another piece of it as we look at it. Uh, I think you're going to want to be able to carry things through and be realistic with complainants too. You want to tell them that you may not be able to. To, to just decide this on the time schedule they wanted to to make other decisions. That was something I took into account and told people in the process. You try to get to what's right and you try to get to it on the time that you can get to it. So it's important to do it. We get better every time one of these investigations is announced. We get better when, when we share this information with each other and get to being best practice we get worse when we kick stuff under the refrigerator until and, and for it to fester. And uh, that's kind of the, the way I feel about this process. It's an important one, but it's an important one in making our sports better. Mm -hmm. No, those, jump, those are, go ahead. Sorry. No, just jumping off of that real quick, something Bob said kind of hit me with this too, is handling previous investigations in a, in a competent manner I think helps also encourage others to come forward. And I think that's part of what you're seeing with the center. Part of the reason the center's caseload and the number of complaints that they've gotten has drastically increased, I think is in part due, not, not that everybody loves them or they think they always get it right, but I think people are seeing that the center takes it seriously and is committed to trying to get it right every time. And when mm -hmm. you see that effort, you see that time being put in, I think it's a lot easier to convince somebody after they see that in other cases on campus or with an, a governing body or whatever the case may be, then go, okay, now I'm encouraged to participate more. And it mm -hmm. might not be, it's not something you could do after somebody kind of comes with a complaint now, but if you're doing that every step of the way, two, three, four, five years in, you're go I think you're going to see a difference in participation in part because 
the trust has been built just because they've seen you from the outside and observed you handling your business in a, in a, in an effective manner. So Jeremy, is... I'm going to jump in Go one ahead. more time, Jeremy, I, and, and to say <laughs> one of the things that draws me to culture and sports and your mission and the mission of culture and sports is not all of this has to be adversarial either. Right. Sometimes we're looking, sometimes we end up talking past each other in the process. So a really good resolution process takes in the idea that we can sometimes agree to find middle ground and common ground and to make things better. So I don't want to forget that that shameless plug about the great work culture and sports <laughs> does in trying to focus attention on, hey, this is my perception, but maybe the reality is in the middle of it. No, thank you for sharing that. Um, I did want to bring up something that both of you talked about, and you both talked about regulations and laws concerning retaliation. In a toxic culture with toxic and abusive leaders, I already see Bob and Michael smiling with my question because they know what it is. So you have toxic leaders, toxic cultures, uh, and some of them are abusive. They already know they shouldn't be doing what they're doing, but they're doing it anyways. What's going to stop them from actually retaliating against that athlete or another coach who files the complaint originally? What's going to stop that retaliation? And then what is the incentive for the the athlete or another coach to file a complaint if they know it's just going to come back them and they're going to be retaliated against if, or if even we, worse than before. If we think about history, it's always the cover up and not the crime. Mm -hmm. So the, the idea that retaliation always provides fresh and often actionable evidence is usually the thing that makes it so good to be able to deal with. We may never decide if you were a good employee or a bad employee, your job performance was up to snuff or it wasn't. But if you're retaliated against shortly after participating in an investigation, or if your work assignment has changed because you, you, you made a report, those are pretty easy and a lot more objective at times. So mm -hmm. I don't want to say that retaliation is easier, but it certainly is often fresher and and easier to show with 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 some certainty in the process kind of on that point too because you're so more focused on it you already know the, the the players involved and so it's easier to get the information you need right away and sometimes the best thing that you can get and you can get this out of retaliation is an immediate pause by maybe there's a temporary suspension maybe there are temporary actions you can take which you might not have been able to on the original claim because there's no way to gather information quickly. Retaliation gives you a way to kind of dig your teeth into that claim, do it quickly, reach some resolution that provides then the time and information and kind of the impetus for people to continue to participate in the larger investigation that you might have ongoing. So it's, it's almost like, I don't know if you can truly prevent it, but sometimes the person retaliating against you gives the investigator what they need to take at least one action and then to proceed to get others to involve too. I also think what most people would maybe not expect, but I think you would see in cases like that is if you see retaliation, if like I'm a player who I've never been the person that felt like I was being harassed or abused by the coach, I, I don't know why you reported it, but now I see that retaliation it might trigger my mind. I got to think about it again. And so now I'm willing to come forward and support the, 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 my fellow player a little bit more because I go, well, the retaliation, if you didn't do anything wrong, there would have been no reason for retaliation. Now I have a reason to think about your behavior towards that person. I'm going to participate in this case. So it's kind of a, when you see bet, more bad being done, it might trigger a good person to come forward and say, I'm participating. Let's make sure you have all the information you need. So it's, it's not preventing the retaliation, but it's using the retaliation to proceed with the larger investigation, the larger evaluation that you definitely need to do in those scenarios. No, that, that makes sense. And thank you for sharing that because, you know, if it is happening to one person, it may be happening to more than one person. Um, and it does bring the opportunity for others to start elevating that or just rethinking the history of, of what they saw and then they may have realized, oh, well, I encountered that too, or I did see something happen and then mm -hmm. they're able to speak up and, and that's extraordinarily important. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, I do have one last question before we move on um, to another topic, but um, 
in your role at uh, in your roles at Shoemaker, and even when you were the athletic integrity officer, Bob and and Michael, when you were at the U.S. Center for Safe Sport, just because an investigation finds something, and just because you make a recommendation, doesn't mean that the organization actually has to follow it. So, so uh, what are some things that you see and that you've worked through over time with these organizations to compel them to say, no, you actually need to address this because you know, the damage to athletes or the damage to just people will be so critical. And if you won't listen to that, it will cost you X millions of dollars to fix it. Like, how do you compel organizations to, to make the proposed changes? I, I probably say just that, that if you don't fix this, it's going to cost <laughs> you X millions of dollars uh, or, or, you know, b almost a billion. Uh, I, I do think the price of, of not correcting is, is significant. And I do think that gets people's attention at times. Um, organizations tend to want to minimize. They want to go on. They want to accept business as usual. But I think we are doing a better job in in, 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 in maybe hardening our organizations against it. Uh, maybe the prevalence of so many reports of misconducts, whether it's from pro teams, pro leagues, uh, investigative reports commissioned by leagues, the fact they become public, I think, is really important. Uh, because even if, even if you don't agree with everything that is made public, even if it may not all be true, or it may be, it may be, shades of truth in the public report, it does create a corrected state that the public can look to and it resets our tolerance. And I think that's an important piece of it. And I, I think building off of that, I also think I've seen a drastic change since when I first started at the center of people just wanting to do right and maybe be a little more, not necessarily strict, but respond appropriately and not try to minimize. I think you're starting to see a little bit of a flip of those working inside sports and athletics that at least enough of them are starting to see the potential consequences in such a way that they're not trying to minimize. They're not trying to do this or that the cover up is worse than the crime itself sometimes. And they're seeing that and they're going like, I don't like what I see. I don't want that in my sport. And I think if, if you're going to do anything, that's where I really think you really hit it particularly at like the national governing bodies, one of the things that I think we found is a lot of the people participating at the national governing bodies are either sports fanatics, just general and want sports to be good and healthy for all people. And they're doing it at a number of NGBs, or I've also worked at NGBs where the people are working in a very specific sport because it's where they have a passion and they don't want their sport to be ruined. And you can kind of use that as your impetus of like, what would happen if this continued or this happened five more times? Like what would happen to your sport? Is it going to be harder to grow? Is it going to be harder to get people to participate? And they see that and they go, Ooh, it would be if I want what's best for my sport, that includes at times having to be the hammer that comes down on people because they're committing violations and doing things poorly. Jeremy, Michael, and you both, both pointed to this in the last question. And it, and it seems to be an important one for us to kind of just at least kind of highlight for a second. I think when 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 we, they're not really bystanders, but other stakeholders step up mm -hmm. and say something is wrong, it doesn't have to be that that everybody has to get fired, everybody has to lose their job, um, or that somebody has to go to you know. I think there's a lie to the movie National Treasure. Well, somebody has to go to jail. Uh, it doesn't have to be that way. But when when the people who are stakeholders step up and say we want it to be different, you get a much better corrected state and an organic corrected state to a toxic environment. Mm -hmm. And that's really the only way we get out that that educated, corrected bystander standing up to the to the state and saying, I'm heard and I'm going to not allow this to go on. We, we're going to treat each other better. We're going to do these things. And sometimes if you've been in that toxic situation, that's the only way you really can get out of it to ameliorate it. So again, telling you stuff you're an expert in, but just the idea that this is important, important stuff. And, and we're in a place where this is changing. We, we think there are more people stepping forward and standing up and willing to not allow it to be as it was. So kind of going off of what we're saying. So 
So there's more investigations, there's more people that are are voicing their concerns or filing reports about things that are happening. Um, but we don't want to be on the reactive side of things. Um, what are some of the work that both of you do with, uh, with the Shoemaker about crisis prevention and why is it important? Well, that's probably the most important piece of, of, of crisis management is keeping them few, keeping them minimized and recognizing when you're when you're in one. Uh, so I, I, I don't know anybody who's ever worked in, in, in any organization or even a law firm to do this. But the idea, if you can prevent things from getting worse, do no harm, minimize harm, you, you easily get out of the situation more cleanly with less less damage reputationally uh monetarily and in human toll so I, I thought my job at Penn State should have been a third investigatory a third policy development and a third education about best best practices the the, the math never quite works out but I think anybody who's in the role that we've set up we now have clients that we advise and we talk to them about their policies we shape their policies we shape their process you know, most most NGBs have learned coaching theory. They've learned uh, they've learned how people respond to work and to rest and to nutrition. They haven't talked a lot about substantive due process as part of what they do or, or how a hearing should go. This is a place where we think we can advise and help also prepare them. And, and pardon a football metaphor from an old offensive lineman: how we can help them identify the unblocked blitzer, the thing that they're not necessarily accounting for but that's coming because it's coming in other places. We're trying to have a broad view of the field. We're trying to have situations and be able to help everybody adjust their defenses to that. Um, you know, hazing is one of those things that we're hearing a lot about right now. And every state or almost every state has a hazing law. Almost every athletic situation has some measure of conduct that, about, about joining teams. Now, a lot of hazing laws don't apply to athletic teams because it's the coach who makes the decision, not the players, and the coaches aren't involved. But it's one that every organization needs greater insight into to avoid that practice. And sometimes even, even kind of, you know, acceptance and initiation is often thought of as just a rite of passage that's fun. And we understand we'd have to tell people that's not that. You have to be exceptionally careful in those circumstances. And because it's just not good. It doesn't, doesn't make you better. It doesn't make you a better athlete. It doesn't make you a better team member, protecting your young players, taking care of them, making them live up to the standard of the team is always an important piece of it. Kind of off of that too, with the prevention, I'll give you a piece. Cause I think the center is really good in, in a very specific area. They've set a policy that applies kind of across the board to all these NGBs. And there's a there's a standard they set, and I think the idea behind it is if you can catch the little things up front, sometimes they don't become the big things, right? The the actions that are taken that are maybe grooming behaviors or behaviors that are setting up for future abuse, and if you can prevent those or stop those and identify the first behaviors because they're violations, you can you can kind of maybe then catch it before it gets going too fast before the train gets down the tracks. And one of them that the center has is if you're communicating with a minor who is not your child or you have, you know, there are some restrictions on this, but generally speaking, coaches, team administrators, adults in the sport, in any sport, should not, not be communicating with minors one-on-one. -on -one. Somebody else should have access to that communication, whether it's a parent, a fellow coach on the team, anybody that kind of could be a fellow adult and kind of help monitor the conversation, just prevent the one-on-one -on -one communication. Well, that's a policy. Then if you start to violate that, it's an indication of potential, like you're starting to groom somebody. You're trying to develop this relationship and head in a path that is not good and will lead to abuse. So we're not preventing the texting, but we're preventing the abuse, which is, I, I would think we'd all agree is the more important behavior to prevent. And we're preventing the abuse by potentially identifying the upfront behavior that would lead to abuse up down the line. And those are those best practices and things are still being figured out and still being worked on. And the center regularly does does work and research into what are the best practices here and how should we do that. And I think Bob and I have a pretty good background on, on helping organizations do the same for theirs, which is 
how do I identify the behaviors that should be unacceptable in themselves because they're indicative of future, future even worse behaviors and worse violations that we can hopefully cut off by catching, catching the smaller thing up front. So I think that's a big piece of it. If you're going to try to prevent it, you're not trying to prevent any violations, in my opinion. And you could. You don't. Education hopefully helps reduce all the violations, but you're not going to be able to get rid of all of them. But if you can catch the smaller ones, you can prevent the bigger ones. And so it's kind of like a cycle of educating and preventing and using small violations to prevent big ones. We hopefully we can reduce the number of major violations as we move forward. It, it also sets you it also sets up as you see minor violations on how you can set defenses and education to help you out too. Mm -hmm. uh, sports betting was one of the things that came up and I learned a lot by looking at looking at how bets were made and learning about it. it's helped me we worked with a group that helped us tailor our our educational efforts and our response efforts. Uh, we avoided a crisis, knock on wood. But the other nice part about it is I wouldn't have even known how to avoid the crisis if I hadn't had that information. So an important important place for us to learn more and to tailor our response uh, to to the small stuff. It's not the absence of mistakes. It's not the absence of violations. It's really the response to them. Now. Um, you talked about a lot of pre-education, uh, helping organizations identify not necessarily shortfalls, but you know the way that they're messaging or the way that they're conducting business. Is when you're working with organizations, are you also working with athletes to say, hey, like this is acceptable behavior, this is not acceptable behavior, or or do you recommend that? Uh, national governing bodies or professional sports teams or, or you know, colleges, or universities provide that training on their own. We're prepared to offer some of that training at Shoemaker. We think that's an important piece for us. Uh, oftentimes, though, we're working with the national governing body or the institution to provide that training. One of the pieces I think is a really important piece for any university we'd be talking to is do you have a code of conduct for your athletes? Do you ha is it aspirational? Does it provide a guide to, to help you? If you don't have one, should you have one? And, and, and how should we help you write that and prepare that? So I think we're prepared to help these organizations operate in this space on a variety of levels, but in a holistic way. Uh, and yeah, I think the athletes are, are the most important piece in this, the constituency, and one we often overlook in talking to and talking to on their level. To that, yeah, no. you, ha you have to speak to them on their level. I, I think... It's very easy for, depending on the, the way someone is raised, right? So we're all coming from different backgrounds. The way I was raised, certain behaviors behaviors I would not have thought of as harassment or hazing or something like that when I was growing up because it was just, they're just coaching you hard, get over it. That means they like you. That means they think you could do well. And to some degree, that might be true. But we've also learned that, no, sometimes they're just being jerks and they're actually harassing you and mistreating you and doing things like that and helping doing some training up front to help them see what kind of where those lines really maybe should be. And everybody might draw their own lines, but drawing distinctions on, no, this is clearly harassment or abuse. This is just hard coaching and helping the athletes see that. That way they know. And again, if we're talking about prevention, if they don't know what early signs there could be of harassment or, or, or um, you know, abuse, then how can then when they get to the big stuff now it's again you're reacting not preventing and that's mm -hmm. what we're trying that's what you want to avoid as much as possible so bob michael already brought this up and it was actually on my list of questions to ask is how do you think a coach's values and beliefs influence their coaching and and the team environment as a whole wow that's a that's a tough question to entirely answer um <laughs> I'd say I'd say they, they they're hugely important uh, in this way. You can't put in you can't put into an environment an ethical structure, a system of fairness, a system of caring that's not in the individuals in it. Um, a head coach has to express it. They have to speak to it. We we call that in the compliance space the tone at the top. Uh, but I think there has to be some, some essential moral code. Now, there are a million approaches inside that. Uh, I've seen very, very, very moral, capable coaches who can be stern. I've seen very warm coaches who can do that. 
I've seen athletes respond one better to a stern coach than to a more lenient coach. I've seen some some respond better to a more lenient one who who who, who takes away the distance. So I think the approach the approach isn't as important as the underlying contract that I'm here for you that my success is your success, your success is my success, and I'm here to help you be the best you can be. And there may be times I speak to the displeasure of your performance or, or my thinking that you can do things better. I'm not really ever talking to my displeasure of you. No, oh, that, that's, a, that, that's a great way to answer that. You know, between both of you, uh, you bringing it up, Michael, and your answer there, Bob, like I think that definitely uh, speaks volumes to people, and I really hope they – they ponder on that for a little bit. Okay, so changing gears here. Uh, both of you are going to be involved in Culture and Sports' first annual leadership summit on the 24th of October. Uh, Shoemaker is leading this session, applying a new legal standard to crisis prevention and response in sports. Can you explain a little bit more about what you're going to talk about and, and why people should listen? Well, if you've gotten to this point in the podcast, you've heard everything we're going to talk about. <laughs> we're going to talk about how the how the world has changed in sports and how sports organizations need to change with them. How we can build a better, more moral, more ethical, and productive sport organization. And ultimately, how the law is going to judge these organizations, whether it's an organization like Safe Sport or it's a, the, possibly the NCA or it's courts but also stakeholders and constituents, parents and athletes. So yeah, we everything we've talked about to here has led us to that point. And that's why we want, we're so excited to be involved. We want to be on the cutting edge and shape this for our clients, but also shape it for the other people who are good and care about this space. So this uh, panel that you're, that you're both leading, you're not sitting there pointing fingers and saying, oh, you're bad as an organization, you're toxic, you're abusive. It's... Um, uh, is this more educational? Is this more prohibitive? Or is this more of just helping organizations and even individuals start, whether it's an internal discussion or a discussion amongst peers about a, a possible direction they may want to go in the future? We'd be pretty toxic if we pointed fingers, right? <laughs> If you look at the panelists too, and I, th I think you'll see, I think anyone who comes that day will see a, a wide variety of expertise from our panelists and a number of people who have very good backgrounds on how do you work within that culture and how do you use your legal standards, whether it's the policies you're writing internally or the law to help shape. And, and I think when Bob and I were talking about one of the things we talked about specifically was we didn't want the focus just to be on the response piece, the how do you do the investigation? How do you handle that? Because prevention is so important and becoming more so every day. Uh, we're, that's one of the things we're learning in this space, I think, all the time is that prevention is so important. And, you know, we want to help people understand, OK, if we're trying to do prevention, what in my sport or in my organization is the the flaw or the thing that I need to focus on and how can I write a policy or a standard that helps prevent abuse or prevent harassment or whatever the case may be in that area and how can I you know kind of tailor it because that's one of the important things too is no organization no two organizations are going to be the same and the policies are, are going to vary depending on the organization and they just inherently need to and if you do that then and if we can help organizations think through how they would do that and the best way to do it, I think that's that's our goal with the panel, I would, I would argue. All three of us teach and coach at some level. And at the end of every class, we get our class evaluations with some fear and trepidation. And, and I've been very lucky. I've usually, they usually have been pretty decent in my career. But the idea is you always want to respond to them, take in the truth of what they say. So I think one of the things we want to also talk about is what tools are already at people's disposal to be better, to, to get things a little right, uh, a little more right in this process. And one of the things that I think courts and others are going to be taking advantage of is, have you heard the athlete's voice? Are you surveying it? Are you responding to it? Are you operating then in compliance with the laws that affect that area? You know, it's... It, it, it one of the great lessons of a lot of our tragedies is that people had this information dropped on their doorstep and they didn't do anything. And I think this is one of the more important parts is, you know, can you can you get to some action that is more positive and makes makes the, 
the system and the sport a better place. And that's kind of what we're going to help outline and also talk about some stories from organizations where that's happened, some people who have experienced it and are fighting for it in, the, in, in real time, and some people who see it at a philosophical level in addition to Michael and I kind of as practical nuts and bolts lawyers. Michael and Bob, thank you so much for taking the time to meet with us today. But before we go, do you, do you each have a final statement to make, whether it's to any athlete, coach, supporting staff, high performance directors, or the athlete support structure, whether it's here in the U.S. or around the world? Yeah, hear each other. Uh, you were an athlete once. You're, you're, you're a coach now. You're a parent everybody's really entering this space for the most part for the right reasons. Begin to look for the, the, the chance to have dialogue and move forward and, and operate with, with that, that good faith in mind. But also, come listen to the, uh, the Culture and Sports Summit. You'll get great perspective. You'll learn a lot. And it's going to be a great opportunity to share with people who I think are fighting for the best ideas in the business. And I guess I'd add one thing, and that is, it's, it's it's kind of a corny phrase. But I think it's more true in this area or as true in this area as any, which is it's never too late to do the right thing, right? You might not have done what you should have done six months ago, a year ago, two years ago, but it's never too late to do the right thing and to make sure that if you were abused, that you can prevent it from happening to others or that we can make sure that we're all pulling in the right direction because the vast majority of people I meet that are involved in sports, played sports, a lot of them had a lot of very good experiences and their life has been improved by it. But you're, if that's even if there were some problems that happened, but if we can make sports better every step of the way, just imagine how helpful that will be for those that come after us. So I think it's never too late to do the right thing is, is a great thing to keep in mind. Always, always be willing to come forward and, and, and do the right thing and, and think, think things through that way. And I think, I think sports will be better for it if we all take that approach. Don't forget to register for the Culture and Sports' first annual Leadership Summit at cultureandsports.com. And that's a wrap for this week's episode of the Culture and Sports Podcast. We hope that this episode has started an internal dialogue, or even one with your team, about the importance of leadership and organizational culture. If you'd like to learn more about Culture and Sports, the Culture and Sports Podcast, or other programs, go to cultureandsports.com, where there is a wealth of resources, articles, research, podcasts, video shows, webinars, and courses. And don't forget to connect with us on social media, on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, YouTube, and LinkedIn at Culture and Sports, and on Twitter at Culture and Sport. Thank you for tuning in to the Culture and Sports Podcast.